So this uh, presentation, uh, as the previous one, is based on the special issue that was uh, just uh, published. Um, in it, um, Jakob Ravendal uh, and I uh, look at uh, the impact uh, in a broader sense of uh, Anders Bering Breivik um, and uh, the July 22nd, 2011 terrorist attacks. So in the immediate aftermath of the, the, um, the attacks, there was a very widespread concern, not just in Norway, but um, around the world, uh, that uh, uh, Bajvik uh, and the attacks uh, would um, create um, a radicalization uh, of uh, the far right, uh, widely speaking, um, and uh, basically, uh, uh, inspire the then ascending uh, anti-Islamic and anti-Muslim far right that had been growing uh, since 9-11 uh, uh, into, into violence. So that you would, in Europe, in Western Europe, the speculation uh, was, uh, get uh, the uh, far right equivalent of uh, Al-Qaeda, right? And um, arguments, of course, in favor of these were, uh, you could say, substantial. Uh, first, he attacked the left wing, the uh, perennial enemy of the far right. And second, the ideological motivation was aligned and uh, directly taken from this uh, anti-Islamic uh, movement and uh, the views shared by many of the radical right parties as well, in Western Europe in particular. And uh, finally, the attacks were skillfully planned and uh, executed and quite uh, dramatic and made a major impact in that sense. Uh, uh, but in the aftermath and in the years to follow, there was a lot of speculation, uh, but uh, very few in-depth uh, uh, empirical investigations uh, into the matter. So um, Jakob and I, uh, we began mapping uh, far-right responses um, in starting in uh, August 2011 and uh, have been mapping it uh, continuously since then, uh, often in collaboration with other colleagues, of course. Uh, but what we've been doing is uh, archiving expressions of overt support, um, but also uh, the absence and negative responses by the far right in general. So that uh, stretches from the populist radical right parties, these now mainstream political uh, parties and actors, uh, more uh, broader activist uh, communities uh, that uh, are active on the streets, but uh, also online, um, more uh, traditional uh, right-wing extremist uh, groups and uh, communities, and also uh, trying to uh, unravel these um, semi-clandestine uh, networks of uh, supporters. Uh, and the data for all of this is available um, online. Most of it, not, not all of it, uh, uh, some of it uh, uh, is not uh, available uh, due to security reasons and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, we base it on letters to and from Bajvik in prison, public statements, online support blogs, message boards, archives, publications, and also newspaper coverage uh, throughout the period. Uh, and the focus is on um, is on the West uh, and um, uh, Russia and parts of uh, the Russian uh, sphere of influence. So uh, now turning to the to the empirical findings of this, we make this um, key distinction uh, between what we uh, call complete and partial rejection, and then over to partial support and complete support. Now. Uh, partial rejection entails basically the, the support of the ideas uh, made public in his uh, manifesto. So if we remember, he uh, committed the attacks as this kind of a propaganda act uh, to disseminate uh, his uh, so-called manifesto and his writings. But so that's what we describe as partial rejection, because it also entails a outright rejection of the violence and the, the attacks themselves. Uh, whereas uh, partial support uh, entails the opposite, so you have the somewhat support of, uh, support of the actions, but not of the ideas. Uh, and then on to complete support, uh, and you could also add another component or a section here, which is uh, kind of active engagement and uh, violence based on, on the um, president of uh, Bajvik. So, uh, in the initial uh, phase after the attacks, um, uh, 
Uh, a lot of um, actors uh, on the far right um, wrote uh, either internally or externally or in the media uh, about uh, the events and about Vivek. And uh, from this, the overarching pattern that uh, we can see and identify is, um, predominantly speaking, complete rejection by the far right. Uh, in particular, from the radical right parties and also these activist groups that are ideologically aligned with the radical right parties, um, often called uh, anti-Islamic or anti-Muslim groups. Um, but you also had uh, predominantly rejection by what we can call white nationalists, so traditional right-wing extremists, neo-Nazis, and so on. So that was the, the initial, uh, primarily the initial uh, response, and it was uh, very uh, uh, consistent. In the immediate aftermath, however, you did see some um, outright support, and um, that came uh, in the West and in Western Europe and uh, North America. It came from a small uh, semi-clandestine or uh, secret uh, community um, that operated uh, primarily online, so uh, scattered individuals um, across a lot of uh, different countries, uh, based on a lot of different uh, motivations. Uh, initially, a lot of them were not uh, ideologically uh, driven at all, but uh, just inspired by the, the violence. So this uh, kind of a sadistic inclination, and you had a lot of uh, uh, women who um, wrote uh, to Breivik uh, in prison, but, but also online and joined this community um, that had uh, what's uh, described as a uh, hybristophilic inclinations. So basically uh, sexual inclinations towards uh, Breivik, romantic inclinations. And then you also had uh, outside of, uh, of uh, the West, uh, you could say, um, Russian neo-Nazis, surprisingly, taking to the streets uh, in homage of Breivik, calling him a, a saint, a hero, um, and uh, sh shouting slogans openly in the streets of Moscow and elsewhere. And he has remained uh, in some of these communities um, uh, something of an icon. But this wasn't where Breivik, uh, th this wasn't the audience Breivik aimed for. Uh, the, the audience that Breivik himself aimed for uh, predominantly rejected him uh, completely. And then as the years uh, passed, uh, we saw a gradual shift. Uh, the white nationalists uh, started embracing Breivik and his uh, actions uh, to an increasing extent. Uh, and uh, you also have um, a few um, instances of uh, lone actor terrorists who openly embra embrace uh, Breivik and have acted uh, partially based uh, uh, on the inspiration that he uh, provided. Um, and then, uh, Originating in the US, you've got a new generation of right-wing extremists that have been uh, organizing uh, online, but have uh, become uh, physical communities. So, so -called, the so-called siege community and uh, others that have also openly embraced uh, Breivik completely. So uh, this opens up a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, and we identify basically four primary, what we describe as puzzles. The first one being, uh, why was there so little support by the far right in Western Europe? But you did see substantial support in Russia and eventually also from American uh, right-wing extremist subcultures. And we believe that the, the, the main explanation to this and also the other uh, patterns uh, is uh, the strength of the cultural taboo against violence. So what's taboo? Uh, taboo mean, basically means uh, forbidden. Um, and uh, taboos, of course, vary very uh, greatly across uh, regions and uh, cultures and across time. And the argument goes in the social science literature that uh, there are very few uh, taboos in existence today in uh, what's described as uh, Western culture. Uh, but the uh, taboo against violence has become uh, uh, even stronger over time. And this is in particular due to its codification and institutionalization through laws and institutions. Uh, and uh, democracy itself is uh, said to be uh, the kind of uh, the paragon uh, of uh, nonviolence, right? Uh, the, the institutionalization, ultimate institutionalization of nonviolence. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, we believe that this variation in this uh, taboo strength, uh, both at uh, the kind of uh, uh, non-institutional and institutional level, uh, provides us with the overarching explanation for this variation. So it is extremely strong uh, if we look at both the institutional level, but also the attitudinal level in Western Europe, for instance, in Norway, uh, uh, 90, uh, some 95% of the population says that uh, uh, political violence is completely unacceptable. Uh, but if you go uh, beyond that sphere, you can see that um, in Russia, it's much weaker. And then the United States is something of an intermediary case where the, the taboo has been uh, somewhat weakened uh, with the time. And now you've got a lot of uh, survey data, recent survey data indicating that this has accelerated and that indeed uh, wide sections of the populace um, to some extent support uh, political violence under certain circumstances. Now, uh, why did the populist radical right parties, furthermore, go to such great lengths to denounce Breivik? Because what they did was uh, they described him as a monster, as a deviant, uh, that they had nothing in common with him whatsoever, completely rejected him. And of course, speaking from it within this kind of bubble, within this sphere where this taboo is very strong, it seems quite self-evident, right? Um, uh, but uh, what we can say is that uh, this stems from the taboo as well, and the contagion, uh, also here not uh, strictly in an uh, epidemiological sense, um, it's also a contingent contagion here on, on the actions of individuals and the institutions. But uh, what we know uh, about taboos are that, well, uh, taboos travel. So that means that uh, the transgressor, the individual or the, the group that transgresses against uh, the taboo, in this case, the violence taboo, also become taboo. And that then diffuses uh, to those that are associated with the, the perpetrator. Uh, and in the aftermath, you, uh, in particular in, in the uh, Nordic countries, there was a massive, massive focus on the populist radical right parties uh, and a discussion and accusations uh, about responsibility for the attacks and so on. Uh, and, and in a direct response, the, the populist radical right uh, went to great lengths uh, to denounce uh, Bayevik, to ward off this taboo transferal, which uh, within this bubble would have made them completely illegitimate, right? Now, onto the third puzzle from the from these patterns is, uh, well, why did uh, initial support for, for Breivik uh, in the West uh, come from a small group of individuals outside the organized far right? Well, so what can account for this? And if we look at uh, the literature on, on uh, social norms and on taboo, uh, the finding, the uh, recurring finding is that you consistently have a very small, often very small minority that um, uh, are uh, willing to rebel or driven to rebel against the taboo. So the, the reasons can vary tremendously depending on what is taboo, uh, but that you can consistently have a, a present minority that is willing uh, to and want to overthrow this uh, taboo. And we believe that this uh, can be, uh, in, the, in, in this case, the, we're talking about individual um, uh, predilections towards inclinations towards the sadistic or uh, of a sexual nature uh, in the fascination with the Bayevik as an individual and the violence in particular that he perpetrated. And that's very evident in the first wave of uh, online uh, mobilization and these support networks and the letters that uh, have been written to Bayevik. Uh, and it's also uh, evident in the second uh, wave now of uh, support emanating from primarily the United States and uh, the uh, um, new, uh, new Nazi and extreme right uh, communities there that are also marked by this uh, extreme sadistic uh, inclination that's evident in their writing and their kind of the sharing of uh, memes and um, well, permeates their uh, kind of uh, cultural expressions. Now, 
we also found that to a certain extent, uh, support uh, did increase uh, with uh, distance and time and space. So we're not talking about a massive uh, increase in, in support here, but uh, it is noticeable. And uh, uh, what can account for this? And, and uh, here we draw on a second stream uh, of uh, research on taboo, namely uh, research on humor and taboo. And uh, there the consistent finding is that, well, the further you get away from the, the attacks or the, the, the events themselves, the, the uh, more acceptable it becomes to joke about it say if it's 9-11 or uh, uh, these terrorist attacks or other events, uh, with time it becomes uh, uh, more acceptable to joke about. Um, and this carries over also onto other spheres. Um, and uh, the uh, basic explanation, underlying explanation for that in, in turn is that the events become perceived as unthreatening. And we see that uh, both in terms of kind of space. So the further away you are from the event in terms of geography and culture, the, uh, the easier it is to kind of uh, uh, embrace it. It becomes somewhat trivial, you could say, uh, and also uh, with the time. So we also believe that this is a partial explanation for the uh, uh, increasing uh, use and adaptation of um, Breivik, as one of, um, not the only, but one of uh, several uh, icons, and in particular due to the, the gruesome nature of the attacks. Um, so one of several icons uh, among these uh, uh, online uh, right-wing extremist subcultures that also uh, kind of um, cross over into uh, what Graham earlier described as dark fandoms, right? Uh, so it's not a kind of clear cut division between the extreme right in this case and other subcultural trends such as uh, the sub, uh, school shooting uh, subculture and so on. Finally, turning now to the implications. Um, so uh, <clears throat> due to the strength of the, the, the taboo, uh, we argue that we are likely to continue seeing low levels of uh, uh, support for Bayevik and similar right-wing terrorists, that the, the uh, conditions simply aren't present uh, for a kind of a major wave of mobilization, that, uh, which the concern was uh, in the immediate aftermath of uh, the attacks, right, that, that uh, you would see this kind of mass radicalization of the far right, in particular in Western Europe, which simply did not occur. Uh, uh, instead, you will continue to see scattered individuals intent on breaking uh, the violence taboo and acting out their uh, uh, violent predilections and impulses within the kind of uh, ideological stream of the extreme right. Um, and, and that this in turn is uh, uh, more or less entirely dependent on their ability to communicate and congregate online. Uh, and uh, uh, furthermore, that uh, we are we are likely to see a somewhat moderate increase uh, when acts become more distant, and as we uh, discussed or I mentioned here, uh, also somewhat uh, more benign or non-threatening. Um, yeah, I think I'll end it there. <laughs>